Cerebral palsy is what happens when there's damage to the base part of the brain, the cerebellum, before the age of two. This is what happened to a woman named Marlene Kleps, who was born prematurely in 1962. What happened over the course of her life, through all of her pain and suffering, can really be said to be nothing short of a miracle. For the average diagnosis of cerebral palsy, it's kind of a wait and see process, since it's hard to diagnose at birth. In Marlene's case, she was a quadriplegic. Her vision was split into doubles and fours. She could hardly speak in an intelligible way at all. And she suffered from various seizures and spasms, which caused her great pain. She became a prisoner in her own body, even though she was surrounded by people often when they cared for her. In her words, it made you grow lonely. It makes you withdraw because it's too much effort. An orphan at the age of two, Marlene and her brother lived with their great-grandparents for many years, who they called mom and dad, but they were later moved to a foster home. Though her grandparents weren't believers in God, Marlene wasn't ever the same way. I always knew that there was a God. I, I knew that there was a God Almighty because the earth was so amazing that, you know, if he could do that, he could do whatever he wanted to, but I didn't know the will of God. And she knew this in part because of a specific woman. But there was, there was one older lady that used to come to our house every Thursday, and she'd pick me up and she'd always tell me, you know, there's a reason why you're alive. Marlene's condition worsened continuously from the time she was diagnosed. In 1974, at the age of 12, she could still walk, but she wore braces all up and down her body, had a neck strap behind her head, and had her right arm strapped to a walker. One time while at school, a group of her classmates came up to her and asked her to come with them to their youth group. They had been praying about her, and God had told them to bring her to the meeting. At that meeting, she prayed to God to come into her life, and she became a believer in Christ. What I received the most was purpose in my life, because before that, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a father, so once I received God as my father, I had a father. I didn't have to wonder why I was alive anymore. Though her body did recover slightly after her conversion, it wasn't a permanent fix, and it only lasted until she was 15 years old. At that point, it began to get worse and worse. You reached a point where the doctors thought you were brain dead? That's true. Explain that. Well, what actually happened, I was at the, this time I was at my, great, or at my grandparents' farm and I, they had a hospital bed set up in their living room for me. And on the December the 28th, and I don't remember this, so don't feel the pain because it's not even a part of me, but my body started to seizure and spasm and it lasted for two days. The seizures had apparently caused her to hit her head, causing yet more brain damage. It was December 1980. Marlene was brought to the hospital where the doctors told her grandparents they thought she was brain dead. The terrifying problem was that she could hear what they were saying. While they discussed her condition at the hospital, she could hear them, but she couldn't respond. She was terrified, believing that they would think all hope was lost and end up killing her. She couldn't move, speak, or even swallow her own saliva, yet in her spirit, she made one last desperate attempt. I was extremely scared. I, I didn't have any rationale on the situation. And I, in, my, in my spirit, because I couldn't get a sound out of my mouth yet, I just cried, God! And I mean, it was with every ounce of my energy. And he came to me and he said, I love you and I'm gonna take care of it. It didn't matter what I'd done for him in the past. It didn't matter what it mattered was my relationship with him right then. And he didn't condemn me for what I hadn't done. He just said, I love you and I'm gonna take care of it. And he just said it over and over and over. Through a miracle of sorts, Marlene was transferred to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where they performed tests on her that determined that she wasn't brain dead. The imminent fear was gone, replaced by peace. However, she had to learn that things would take place not on her timeline, but on God's. Nancy White, her nurse, said, Marlene was a spastic quadriplegic and pretty much dependent on other people to provide for her needs. She needed someone to help her get in and out of bed, in and out of her wheelchair, and to help her go to the bathroom. She was pretty much dependent to the point where she really didn't do a lot physically herself. And the physician, Dr. Glenn White, noted, She didn't have really any control of her head or her neck. Her neck was sort of tipped back, and her lips and tongue were kind of swollen and drooling. That's a very tough state to be in. Reviewing team notes and team meetings, the staff was thinking that there really wasn't a hope for recovery. She had partial eye and mouth movement and could make a few sounds, but nothing more. And this lasted for months. God kept returning to her saying, I love you and I'm gonna take care of it. But she eventually lost interest and that lost interest turned into anger. The lack of progress in treatment and healing made it likely that she would return to the nursing home in her hometown in Missouri. And the stress of her condition was tearing her family apart. 
Not knowing God's will, she blamed him for the spirit in her family and for her condition. But she was given an overwhelming sense of peace, in which her attitude was totally changed. She was also granted a vision of a woman riding a bike in a green field, and after a few minutes, she slowly recognized that it was a vision of herself in that field riding that bike. More than that, the vision continued. The vision didn't even just, it wasn't even just the bike. He, it went on, it was a whole series, and he showed me inside a church. He showed what I had on. I had on a striped velour shirt. I had on rust-colored corduroy pants. He showed me the church with the red carpet, light woodwork, a triangle glass doorknob, he, and even shows a man in particular what he looked like that was praying for me. And then at the end of the vision, it says March 29th in great big bold black letters. That man was a pastor in that church, and he was wearing a pinstripe suit while praying over her. After slowly communicating all of this to her roommate, another Christian woman, the two of them discovered that March 29th was coming soon, and it landed on a Sunday. In addition, that shirt she had seen in the vision arrived for her as a gift in the mail. Things were going well for a few weeks, and then it all fell apart. Marlene had only been able to tell her hospital roommate her vision, and the two of them were the only ones who knew but her roommate was discharged from the hospital before the date arrived. On top of that, Marlene's grandparents had gone home to rest as well, and she was all alone, unable to move, and now it was March 28th. She panicked. Up until that moment, she had trusted in God to help her, but she just couldn't see how it could be done. She doubted God, but she asked him to forgive her of her own thoughts, and he did. Then he gave her a glimmer of hope. Marlene heard God tell her to get the morning nurse to bring her the phone book, and he'd give her the name of the church that she'd seen in the vision. When the morning came, she insisted over and over again that the nurse should get the yellow pages. She went and got them. She, she started flipping through the yellow pages, and two lines just glowed off the page. It said, Open Bible, Scott Emerson, and a phone number. But she wouldn't call. Why? It scared her. I mean, she <laughs> left the room. She didn't feed me, she didn't do anything. I mean, she slammed the book down, she left the room. The morning trailed away, and finally around 12.30, the nurse reluctantly called the church. She angrily told them, I don't know who you are, but you better get down here. She gave Pastor Emerson the room number, but not the hospital name, and she slammed the phone down. Only when 4 p.m. rolled around did Pastor Emerson actually find Marlene, and he walked in wearing a pinstripe suit. He took her to his church there in Rochester and prayed over her with the seven other people there for the evening service. They had never had a healing miracle in their church, nor did they really know how to pray, but they did anyway. Then Scott asked if Marlene wanted to stand in faith. She didn't really know what he meant, but she wanted to stand. And immediately upon lifting her out of the chair, we began to feel uh, strength coming into her legs. And she took a hold of the back of the pew and she just left. And my feet hit the floor and I felt the floor for the first time in my life. At first, she was held up, but as they made laps around the church, Marlene began to walk more and more on her own, until she was running around the sanctuary without any assistance. She felt her eyes get warm, took off her glasses, and never needed them again. After that, they returned to the clinic, much to the surprise of the nurses there. All they needed to do was discharge her. The hospital records read, You returned to the rehabilitation unit that evening walking, something you'd never done since your admission to the unit. And when I saw you back at the clinic some weeks later, you'd improved even more, and all signs of previous abnormality were gone. You were able to walk perfectly normal, and your eyesight had improved so much that you did not need to wear spectacles. We were all very thrilled and happy with the outcome of your condition. Having never qualified for higher education, Marlene has since gone to Missouri Wesleyan College, traveled around speaking to different churches, and even opened a flower shop in her home state of Missouri. She is still active, walking and talking to whomever will have her, and there's video of her speaking at a church as late as 2018. Not everyone's relationship with God involves miraculous healing, but not everyone has cerebral palsy. In this video, I talk about how Jordan Peterson's daughter, Michaela, has fostered a relationship with God recently. See you next time.